toil for both George Winovich and Michael DeWine. It was cold, but not that cold. And the choir sang, the band played, the national anthem was sung, and Michael so DeWine was ceremonially sworn in as Lieutenant Governor. Then, the moment George Voinovich dreamed about had arrived. He was to be sworn in by the Honorable Charles Kerfus, who befriended a young state representative back in 1967. That young man was now waiting to be sworn in as the 65th governor of Ohio. The family gathered around as family Bibles were placed before the governor-elect. George, are you prepared to take the oath of office as Ohio's governor? Yes, I am. Would you then please place your left hand on your family Bible, which rests on the 1763 Bible, which belonged to Ohio's third governor, Samuel Huntington. Raise your right hand and please repeat after me. I, George Victor Voinovich, do solemnly swear. I, George Victor Voinovich, do solemnly swear that I shall faithfully and honestly discharge. That I shall faithfully and honestly discharge the duties of the office of Governor of Ohio. The duties of the office of Governor of Ohio. And shall preserve, protect, and defend. Shall preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of Ohio. The Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of Ohio. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations, Governor. You may now kiss the First Lady. <laughs> Then it was time for the new governor to deliver his inaugural address. It had been a long road from Cleveland's east side. Ohio has traversed its share of passages, literally carved out of the wilderness, scratched from hostile territory, and born in the midst of scarcity and isolation. And Ohio rose from a few rough frontier outposts to a leader among states. We could grow anything, build anything, dream anything, and we did it better than anyone else. From apples to tires, from corn to steel, from soybeans to glass, Ohio led the way for an emerging nation. At the turn of this century, Ohio was the touchstone of the Industrial Revolution and the cradle of American presidents. Ohioans were first in flight and in our time, first on the moon. Ours is a great state with a proud history, but recent years have not been so kind to Ohio. Today, we are no growth state. Our education system is lagging, and we have a one and a half to two billion dollar budget shortfall ahead of us. Clearly, Ohio is not working up to its capacity. These are the new realities that this generation of Ohioans must confront. And our challenge today is to regard those realities as a golden opportunity to take a fresh look at ourselves and to make Ohio a leader once again. But just as the private sector is adjusting to the new realities of a more competitive world, so too must the public sector. We must be realistic about the limits to what government can accomplish and the limits to what government money can buy. The now the budget crisis we face obligates me and our state senators and representatives to re-examine the way Ohio spends taxpayer dollars. Gone are the days when public officials are measured by how much they spend on a problem. The new realities dictate that public officials are now judged on whether they can work harder and smarter and do more with less. A recent Wall Street editorial put it best when it said that we in government should quit finagling around the edges of the status quo. We must distinguish between what we are able to do well and what we cannot do at all. In fact, 
the notion of not having government do something about everything is itself an extraordinary opportunity. We should and we will propose new approaches to deal with the new realities and some older existing problems as well. We will place special emphasis on management, economic development, and education. Now, I'm pretty well aware of the fact that talking about better management won't win any popularity contests, but I think some people miss the boat. Better management and state resor of state resources, of state services, and of taxpayer dollars all add up to a better quality of life for the people of Ohio. The Plain Dealer recently printed a series of letters from citizens who described in detail the drastic impact poor management has had on their lives. One lady wrote, there's a form of child abuse called neglect from delinquent fathers. These are parents who willingly and deliberately abandon their own flesh and blood. The writer described the lack of help she had received from the state's Child Support Enforcement Agency and from employees who did not seem to care about their jobs and had not bothered to learn the new laws governing child support. Another citizen asked, is the workers' compensation system a good one? Ask the injured workers who have claims how they feel. Ask them if they've lost their families, their homes, their dignity, because the system isn't doing its job. The lives of these two people have taken severe turns for the worse because of poor management. And God only knows how many more there are. And I truly shudder at the thought of how much loss, suffering, and hardship we bring into the lives of people every day because we're just not doing those jo the job. Those two people, and thousand more like them, will tell you that management does have a direct impact on their quality of life. We've got to do better, and we will do better. Our second area of special emphasis will be economic development. The people of Ohio understand that a good job is at the heart of the American dream. But as I said earlier, we're still in the midst of some tough times. During this nation's longest peacetime economic recovery in the 80s, Ohio lagged behind. Our industrial and manufacturing sectors have lost thousands of jobs. One study rated Ohio 26th out of 29 states in industrial climate. It is not surprising that under those circumstances that we have lost population. As a matter of fact, we are losing two United States congressmen. The Ohio economy is truly at a crossroads. To make matters worse, we're one of 30 states with projected budget shortfalls. That's the bad news. But the good news is we, if we deal with our budget deficit and define what we want Ohio to be, we can leap out in front of those other states and get out and compete in the 90s and be a leader in the next century. We must create a business environment that allows us to retain, expand, and attract more and better jobs. We must emphasize science and technology and the export of Ohio products into the global marketplace. Above all else, we must recapture the innovative spirit that made Ohio a leader at the turn of the century so that when the 21st century dawns, we will be a leader again. We all know that if we're going to accomplish this goal, Ohio must recommit to something very fundamental, education. I will be the education governor, and Ohio will be the education state. <laughs> education is everyone's business. If we really love our neighbors, as the Bible tells us to do, 
then we must do everything in our power to develop our neighbors' God-given talents so they can take care of themselves and their families and make a contribution to society. And if we can't reach people with that message, folks, then we've got to tell them that education is also our most important economic development tool. It's the only tool that we have to prepare our citizens for the jobs of the future. And if all else fails, we must convince Ohioans that education is their best investment. We've had enough crime, we've had enough drugs, we've had enough welfare, but we haven't had enough education in the state of Ohio. And it will be my responsibility to assure every Ohioan that the money that we are spending on education is being well spent. That's very important. Our vision for Ohio is a state whose leaders are as good and decent and honest as its people. A leader in fighting the war against crime and drugs. A leader in providing access to quality, affordable health care a leader in cleaning up our environment, and a leader in everything we do. For us, to be, for us to be successful, state government must lead the way. And I want you to know that from this day forward, my job as governor will be to instill in every single state employee a sense of the tremendous opportunity we have before us to serve our fellow Ohioans and to make a difference in their lives. If we're going to get Ohio to work up to its capacity, then we must work up to our capacity. I'm going to spend a lot of time in the coming months with my fellow public servants in state government to get their ideas on how we can work harder and smarter and do more with less. And I'm confident that most of the ideas that we're going to get to improve state government are going to come from our own state employees. But I want you to know we can't do it alone. We have to have the help of others. Already, more than 400 volunteers are serving on committees to help us select our management team for the next four years. We're also putting together an operations improvement task force to help us find ways to streamline state government. These are just the first steps in a larger plan to mobilize Ohioans from all walks of life, young and old, black and white, in the most far-reaching volunteer effort ever undertaken in the state of Ohio. It will extend to Ohio's two million young people, whom we will encourage to get involved in a new Ohio Youth Corps aimed at giving girls and boys the chance to do something for other people. A wise man once said that those who bring sunshine into the lives of others can't keep it from themselves. We've got to get our kids feeling good about themselves. Perhaps my greatest challenge of governor will be to convince every Ohioan that they are truly needed that they can make a difference. One organization, one group, one person can make a difference in someone's life. That's why this morning the governor's office adopted an elementary school. We want to make a difference in the lives of these children, and we will. And this is something that I understand from my own personal experience. In fact, if it wasn't for the fact of two individuals that made a difference in my father's life, I wouldn't be here today. When my dad was 16 years of age, the man that was raising him wanted him to quit school and become a construction laborer. His high school principal and his high school history teacher came out and convinced this man to keep my father in school. They got him a job in an architect's office at night. He graduated from high school, got a Kroger scholarship to Carnegie Tech, became an architect, became president of the Architect Society of Ohio and on the State Board of Examiners. And to the day he died, there were two pictures on his wall. Pop Shriver and Mr. Finley, who was the principal of his high school.
Ohio's 200th birthday is right around the corner. And it's up to us to decide what kind of celebration it will be. Will we be celebrating our past or will we be celebrating our future? Will we be talking about the good old days or about the new good days? I believe with all of my heart that our best days are still ahead. I believe the best chapters of Ohio's history are yet to be written. And I believe that our proud past will be outshone by an even prouder future. With God's help and together, we can do it. Thank you. Come here, babe. You want to know something? It took Governor Voinovich just a few minutes from the time he accepted the plaudits of the crowd to his first act as governor. He signed executive orders that bar the solicitation of campaign donations from administrative employees. It served notice that he was going to be a no-nonsense governor. But then he took the remainder of the day to enjoy the party thrown in his honor. A parade wound through downtown Columbus. Later in the afternoon, an Ohio Heritage Celebration was held in the Vern Reif Center for Government and the Arts. The diversity of the performers reflected the pool of nationalities that make up the state of Ohio. just underscores that one of the reasons why Ohio is such a very, very special state is that we have so many various ethnic groups that make up our great state. We'd like to refer to it as a, as a beautiful mosaic. And you know, it goes beyond that. It goes beyond the various ethnic groups, but what it underscores is this, folks. We've all come over in different boats but we're all in the same boat.
Then it was time to don gowns and tuxedos for a round of celebration balls. There was the governor's ball at the Aladdin Temple Shrine. The Carnation Ball at the Hyatt Regency Hotel. It's the end thing for the Republicans. Uh, actually, I think the Democrats and Independents would be happy to wear these. <laughs> we got that. We're, we're, br we're bringing them all under the umbrella. <laughs> third one was the chairman's ball, thrown to honor Paul Mifsud, the governor's campaign chairman and chief of staff in the new administration. Since every one of you know me, how much did I have to pay him to do that? It was actually only two golden eagles. Uh, you're all friends, you're all important. I want to recognize the legislative leadership that's here, but most importantly, our inaugural co-chairmen that are here. I think they deserve a round of applause. I didn't do any of this. They, uh, George Winovich, his wife Janet, his son George, his son Peter, and his daughter Betsy. It will come as no surprise to those who know George Winovich that in the midst of the celebration, the pomp and the ceremony, he was already thinking ahead to his new responsibilities. It's fair to say he will take those in stride, just like he has always done. I think so often in life that when things aren't going well, instead of looking to ourselves and figuring out what we can do more, we have a tendency to look someplace else and say the problem I've got is because somebody else isn't doing something or they're doing something to me when if we were more honest we would discover that there's a whole lot that we can do about our our condition and I'm governor of Ohio and I've got an opportunity through the various departments of state government and commissions and my bully pulpit to have an impact on, on changing things and I intend to change what I'm able to change and not cry over spilt milk. I mean, nobody's going to come to Ohio and solve our problems for us. We're going to solve them ourselves. If we've got bad financial mess, if we have a management mess, and boy, we do have a management mess. I mean, people messed it up, and people can fix it up. <laughs>